Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our Curious Amalgam. I'm Alicia Downey, and the title of today's episode is, Is This a New Era of Federal Trade Regulation by Rule? The Past, Present, and Future of FTC Rulemaking. For decades, the FTC has relied on its adjudicatory authority to challenge unfair methods of competition, applying its expertise on a case-by-case basis in administrative litigation. The FTC then turned increasingly to federal courts and began seeking monetary relief, permanent injunctions, disgorgement, and more. In May 2021, the Supreme Court put the brakes on this process in a case called AMG Capital Management versus FTC. And the FTC has identified that case as a key turning point that has hampered the agency's enforcement capabilities. Now FTC leadership seems to be shifting toward a regulatory model, and recent FTC actions indicate the agency may rely more on legislative-style rulemaking to restrain anti-competitive practices. In this episode, we'll talk with an expert about the past, present, and future of FTC rulemaking. My co-host today is Jana Seidel. Hi, Jana. Hi, Alicia. Would you like to introduce today's guest, Absolutely. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce Adam White, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a co-director of George Mason University's Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State. So he's really been enmeshed in these issues that we're talking about today. Adam is also a vice chair of the ABA's Administrative Law Section, and he's a member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Last year, Adam served as a commissioner on the President's Commission on the Supreme Court of the U.S. And before joining academia, Adam practiced constitutional and administrative law at two firms in Washington and clerked for Judge David Santal at the D.C. Circuit. Welcome to the show, Adam. Well, thanks. Thanks, both of you. It's so great to be here. Okay, let's dive right in. Let's start with the basics. So as Alicia already mentioned, the FTC has authority over unfair deceptive acts and practices, UDAP, and then unfair methods of competition, which we'll refer to as UMC for short. And for decades, we've seen the agency focus on enforcement, and now there seems to be the shift towards rulemaking, with some commenting that we should get ready for an avalanche of rulemaking. What animated this? Well, as Alicia mentioned at the outset, sort of the most immediate trigger of the shift at the FTC from enforcement to rulemaking was the Supreme Court's recent decision in AMG Capital Management versus FTC, where the court interpreted the FTC statute as a limitation on the agency's ability to seek restitution or disgorgement in enforcement actions. So, as I understand it, basically limited the FTC to more forward-looking relief uh, and not be, not, and not allowing the agency to, as, it, as the agency sees it, undo damage that had already occurred. Of course, that's still an important tool in the, in the agency's uh, toolkit going forward, forward-looking relief. But to the extent that the agency wants to prevent more wrongdoing as it sees it early on, rulemaking tends to be a good tool for that. It, you pres- the agency prescribes rules that put the entire industry on notice um, going forward ahead of any activity by the agency. I, I would say, panning backwards, that in general, agencies have tended – over the decades towards rulemaking, different agencies at different paces. The, the National Labor Relations Board, for example, is famously an adjudication and enforcement first agency, much as the FTC has been. But other agencies had tended towards rulemaking, sometimes very sweeping rulemakings. And there's, there's pros and cons to all of that. I would say one last thing is that the, the new leadership of the FTC clearly arrived with a, a, a pretty energetic uh, agenda of, of serious policy change and also serious procedural change at the agency. And so I think the arrival of this particular leadership at this particular moment in time was certainly a central reason for the, the, the pretty dramatic shift in posture by the agency. Thanks for that background. So 
Turning to rulemaking, and for those of us less familiar with administrative law and kind of the works of how this actually gets done, can you briefly walk us through the common types of rulemaking? I understand there's informal, formal, and hybrid rulemaking. What are the steps and rough timelines? Which one of these is how the FTC rulemaking typically works? Sure. And and everybody who's out there listening, get your coffee cups because this stuff <laughs> sometimes gets a little dry. Mostly when we talk about rulemaking in general, and the FTC is a little different, I'll get to that in a minute. But in general, when an agency does rulemaking, this, we call the process notice and comment. The agency is re- generally required under the APA to give a notice of in, if it's intended uh, policy change, it's intended interpretation of its statutory authorities, and and a basic sort of factual basis for the rule that it wants to promulgate. Then it opens up a comment window where just about anybody can submit comments uh, offering legal arguments, policy arguments, factual arguments, factual materials, any of that. And the agency under the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, has to take it pretty seriously. They don't need to run to ground every single comment, especially sort of ones of marginal relevance or seriousness. But anytime the agency gets a credible comment that is relevant to the real substance of the agency's proposed policy, the agency has to grapple with it seriously. And then at the end of this process, they issue the, the agency issues its final rule, which sets forth both the specific text of the new regulation, but also its reasoning process towards those rules, including grappling with Uh, the comments that it received. That process serves a couple of purposes. First, it helps to inform the agency uh, and also the public. It also then creates a good record for judicial review when, as usual, it happens, somebody uh, who's affected by the rule challenges the rule in court. That's the normal process, but it's usually called notice and comment. Its technical term is informal rulemaking. Well, if that's informal rulemaking, then what's formal rulemaking? Formal rulemaking is much more of a class. It's classically described as a trial type process where under the APA or other under other statutes, people have certain people have a right to participate much more directly in 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 giving testimony, cross examining witnesses. It's a much more court like process. That's formal rulemaking. Finally, um, I'd say for for all of those, the agency might start the process early with what's called an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, For most agencies, this is not required. For the FTC, it sometimes is, and we can get to that. But when an agency does an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, it's a much more general um, announcement of what the agency hopes or intends to do. And you put that kind of advance notice out in order to get the public to submit comments early so that the agency's first real official step, its notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, can have much more substance and can be a bit better thought through. Um, so that's that. those are the main forms of rulemaking. The FTC has its own special statutory procedural requirements under the Magnuson Moss Act. This arose after an important D.C. Circuit case in the 1970s that required some of the FTC's rules to go through a much more rigorous process that looks a lot more like formal rulemaking, where the agency actually has to put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. If I remember correctly, they even have to notify Congress of their intention to do a rule. Then when they put out their proposed rule, there is something like a formal rulemaking hearing where the, where members, uh, where interested members of the public have some opportunity to cross-examine uh, witnesses. And then finally, the agency's rule, its statement of basis and purpose has to be much more thorough than, as I take it, normal rules have to be. That's, again, that was created by the Magnus and Moss Act. It, it certainly applies to the FTC's UDAP rulemaking, and there's a sort of an argument now over whether it also applies to the to the FTC's rulemaking for unfair methods of competition. So you mentioned that sometimes the FTC is required to issue this advance notice, or ANPRM, right, for short. Can you tell us what circumstances that applies to? Does it have anything to do with UDAP versus UMC? What are the considerations there? <laughs> 
Yeah, and here's where I warn your audience. I am a regulatory generalist, and my own background uh, was first and foremost as an energy regulatory guy at the great firm of Baker Botts, which I think, Yana, you have some affection for. Um, yes, absolutely. So, so I tread a little warily here when I get really into the weeds on, on FTC. And Yana, Alicia, feel free to gently point out when I get something horrifically wrong, okay? but So uh, to your question, Yana, about um, these rulemaking procedures, there was a case in the 1970s called National Petroleum Refiners versus FTC, where the FTC, after decades of being an enforcement first and adjudication first agency, proposed some regulations that I think the regulations in that case were um, they were unfair deceptive acts and practice regulations, um, first and foremost. They might have also... Alicia, you might know they might they they might also have been put forward as as uh, as uh, as unfair methods of competition regulation. But in any event, the D.C. Circuit allowed that regulatory process to stand in this case, National Petroleum Refiners, and it spurred real criticism. There was real concern that the FTC, in particular, was uniquely ill suited to be a rulemaking first. Agency, I think because the subject matter of FTC regulations, especially on unfair, deceptive acts and practices, that those sorts of things, Congress or, or the public or industry really thought they ought to be dealt with much more carefully on a case-by-case basis and not with sweeping rulemakings, which have a lot of benefits, but sometimes they come at the cost of being too generalized and not really taking sufficient um, consideration of, of the facts on the ground. So after the D.C. Circuit approved the FTC's rulemaking in National Petroleum Refiners, I think it was had to do with octane labels for gas pumps, Congress came back and passed the Magnuson-Moss Act, where they required the FTC specifically to undergo these much more thorough rulemaking procedures. You can read the statute two ways. Um, Either the Magnuson-Moss Act applies only to UDAP rulemakings. It, it, it definitely applies to UDAP rulemakings. But the question is, does it also apply to unfair methods of competition rulemaking? Um, Professor Dick Pierce of George Washington, sort of the, the, the dean of administrative law scholars, he's argued recently in a paper that, that came out from the center I run at George Mason that the the Clearly, the in his opinion, clearly the best reading of the statute and of Congress's intent in passing that statute was to apply the heightened rulemaking procedures to both UDAP rulemakings and UMC, unfair methods of competition rulemakings. The FTC's current leadership, as they've sketched out their approach in their, their December of 2021 statement of regulatory principles and in their other statements, have indicated, as I take it, that they don't necessarily accept that these heightened rulemaking procedures actually do apply also to unfair methods of competition. So with, that's surely a question that's going to be litigated what, sort of within the FTC among the five commissioners, um, and then almost surely in court in any challenge to an FTC uh, unfair methods of competition rulemaking that doesn't go through the heightened Magnus and Moss rulemaking procedures. Thank you for that explanation. So it sounds like from your description, the Magnus and Moss rulemaking is a lot more unwieldy and takes a lot longer for the FTC to do. So my understanding is that they didn't really use that in a lot in the past. Is that correct? Yeah, both in, in your characterization of formal rule of the, the broader rulemaking process and I think with the FTC's history. Just by way of background, you know, the Administrative Procedure Act, which applies to all agencies. From the start, 75 years ago last year, had both this notice and comment rulemaking process and the heightened, more formal rulemaking process. And early on, agencies sometimes used the formal rulemaking process. And it took a long time, much longer than the agencies and often members of the public um, on certain sides of issues thought that the rulemaking process should take. So agencies moved towards more and more notice and comment rulemaking instead of the more formal rulemaking. And the Supreme Court heard a case in the 1970s on the question of whether they needed, uh, wh- whether the agencies needed to use the formal rulemaking process or whether they had more discretion to use notice and comment rulemaking. And the Supreme Court held that actually, unless the, the, the statute very explicitly says the agency has to use formal rulemaking, there, there's magic words that the court looks for regarding whether a rulemaking has to be on the record. Um, 
normally the agency can just pick notice and comment rulemaking. And so agencies do. They almost always use notice and comment rulemaking instead of the formal rulemaking process. The FTC, of course, was hemmed in more by the Magnus and Moss Act, which pretty cl- which very clearly does require the more formal rulemaking for certain kinds of rules. Um, and again, the agency's history, with the exception of that sort of flurry of rulemaking activity in the 1970s, the agency has always been geared towards enforcement and case-by-case adjudication rather than rulemaking. So I think it was a mix of both just the, the practical difficulties of the Magnus and Moss rulemaking process and the agency's general history and habits and, and sort of proficiency in the case-first, enforcement-first um, method that has, until now, kept the FTC away from rulemakings. So what's changed then? I, I know that the FTC recently amended the process for um, rulemaking in what, July of last year. Yeah. What did they do? What, why do we care about those changes? Well, the, the FTC signals first its intention to use rulemaking, which was a big shot across the bow of a lot of folks, and, and in sort of tidying up their rulemaking process. And I'm much less well-versed in what specifically they've changed in their own procedures, but I, as I understand it, they were sort of cleaning up some some procedures uh, to, to prepare the way for, for much more rulemaking activity. Um, I think what's changed um, in terms of the FTC's approach is that it wants to, the FTC under its current leadership wants to make some significant changes in policy, in some interpretations of the law, and also in some basic assessments of the facts on the ground. And for those sorts of things, agencies Generally, when they're making major changes in policy or legal interpretation or even factual assessments, they have to go back to what they've previously done and and specifically account for why they are now changing their minds. Given that the agency has done so much over time through a mix of enforcement and adjudication um, and and case law in the courts and, and also policy statements, the most efficient way to do this would be, where possible, uh, through rulemakings, where you can do a lot all in one record at one time and try to fundamentally reorient the agency's approach at a wholesale level rather than a retail level. Again, there are costs to that, both in terms of the complication of the process sometimes. There's costs in terms of when you make sort of broad policy judgments, you lose the benefits of case-by-case analysis. Of course, one of the benefits is that you're putting the entire industry on notice. Um, that's a benefit certainly to the agency and to some lots of stakeholders and sometimes to industry itself, although not always. Um, so that's all the, the sort of going to change with the shift to rulemaking. Um, I would say one last thing. The shift to rulemaking creates two levels of uncertainty. It creates some uncertainty sort of within the FTC's own proceedings over what the new approach of the FTC is going to be. We don't know how far the FTC is going to try to push uh, its legal authorities. Second, there's a level of uncertainty in judicial review because at the same time that the FTC is changing what it's doing, the courts, the Supreme Court especially, but also courts of appeals, um, are starting to rethink a few different things, things related to statutory interpretation, agency process, and so on. And so you have some uncertainty in the court. Um, my friend David Shaw at Morrison and Forrest, Forrester, he and his colleagues refer to this as uncertainty squared. And I think that's a really important, that's a very good way of putting it. You have uncertainty squared because we don't know what the agency wants to do. We don't know what the court's going to want to do. And maybe you could say it's uncertainty cubed because the uncertainty in the courts will probably inform the agency's own judgments. Too. So it has to sort of think through in advance what it wants to do now to build up the record that will survive judicial review down the road. Uncertainty cubed. I like that. Um, that that's a good way of yeah. capturing what we're dealing with right now. In in terms of, um, well, I, and I want to be clear here, not to interrupt, but I'm totally sh- shamelessly stealing the whole the whole <laughs> framework from from the, for the good folks at Morrison and Forrester. Understood. That's okay. You, for that. You're giving them credit. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So in this uncertainty cubed world we are in, do we have any sense in what areas um, there may be rulemaking by the FTC? I know that they've announced a few, and so I figured I would I would get your perspective on where we might be looking at new rules 
Okay, so now, here's the part where I'm just going to start getting in on, under my depth. So I'm going to keep it at a real broad level. I, I, yeah, I think high level topics is best for audience. Yeah, that's fine. The F, so first of all, on unfair and deceptive acts and practices, um, there's a lot that that the FTC might do, just given changes in technology. Right, we're seeing so much happening with the way that some of the larger tech companies are holding themselves out to the public. Obviously, there's debates over social media platforms, over things like Amazon. Um, and also over older technologies, right? The FTC weighed in on uh, robocalls years ago. Last I checked, uh, the robots are still calling. At least they're still calling me. And I know there's a lot of pent-up frustration over things like that. So just changes in technology and the ability of some companies to sort of not be encumbered by existing FTC policy, I think the agency is going to is going to take a fresh look at a lot of those things. But honestly, um, and from my approach um, or from my standpoint, the really big issues that are going to be reconsidered are antitrust. And the FTC has made this clear under the new leadership and also sort of with wind in the sails from from the White House with President Biden's executive order on competition and, and bigness, which is, by the way, is surely deeply informed by one of President Biden's White House advisors, uh, Tim Wu, the law professor from Columbia, who's been a leading scholar on issues of rethinking antitrust. The FTC clearly, first and foremost, wants to take a much different approach to this. It's in part the approach that the current chairman, chairwoman uh, Lena Khan sketched out in some of her own scholarship, getting away from the FTC's traditional consumer welfare approach to, um, to, to antitrust regulation and taking a different approach. It's not clear to me quite yet what the approach is, but that really is a, a big, big deal. And it, it's clearly is central to the, the, the um, oh, I, What's the right way, way, way to put it? The the energy and the attention of Chairwoman Khan and some of the others. And so I think that'll be a big, big part of their rulemaking agenda. And by the way, to the extent that they can get rulemakings out on these issues that are of the greatest importance to the current leadership, that means that future FTCs would have to undo those policies through rule, probably through rulemakings of their own, unless the courts uh, strike down the original rulemakings. So an FTC that wants to sort of entrench these policies going forward uh, is going to lean more heavily on rulemaking in order to require their successors to lean more heavily on rulemaking. Well, I guess we'll see how this all plays out. It'll be interesting. And uh, we encourage everyone to get your pencils ready for your participation in the notice and comment process. Yeah. And I should also note that um, you know, every episode on Our Curious Amalgam gets its own dedicated webpage. We'll post links on this webpage to the FTC's December 2021 Statement of Principles that Adam referred to uh, and to some other materials that might be of interest. Uh, yeah. But I, I, just to be clear, though, for people who perhaps aren't following this on a daily basis, no proposed rules have been issued yet, Correct. Right. That's right. As I understand it, that's right. The FTC is doing a combination of things. Uh, its leadership is saying some things sort of in advance through speeches, through the, the, the statement of regulatory priorities that they put out. And also the FTC, as with all agencies, is in regular dialogue with a number of, of um, constituencies or stakeholder groups, we'll say. Um, and that always informs a rulemaking process before the notice of proposed rulemaking, even before the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, if the agency is going to use that, you'll get both outreach from the agency to stakeholder groups, and also you'll get groups filing petitions with the agency, urging them to begin a rulemaking process. For example, as I understand it, the Institute for Policy Integrity, which is a, a think tank, an advocacy group based at NYU, it's, it's led by Professor Ricky Revez. They've already um, filed a petition with the FTC asking the agency to regulate what's called uh, drip pricing, which, um, I, 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 again, I'm not an FTC specialist, so I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I take it to be the thing we encounter all too often in daily life where you get sort of a listed price up front for a good or service, and then little by little the fees add up. Uh, I'm going to be flying on planes uh, this weekend, so I know uh, drip pricing all too well. Um, but I, I guess the, the Institute for Policy Integrity is has submitted a petition for rulemaking on that subject. And my guess is that the agency will receive some of those along the way too. Um, so but, for all the people yeah. who are getting out their pencils and getting ready for notice and comment rulemaking, it's important to really take the process seriously for two reasons. 
One is the more that you that that people reach out to the agencies in advance, the more that you have a hope for shaping the notice of proposed rulemaking, which doesn't totally lock the agency in, but really usually de- describes the general parameters of what the agency wants to do. And then second, once the agency's put out its notice, you have to get comments in because the record for the final rule and the record for judicial review is 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 limited overwhelmingly to the the record before the agency in the rulemaking process. By the time you get to judicial review, it's basically too late to, because the courts aren't so much interested in um, – how should I put this? Let me put it this way. When an agency makes a rule and it goes to court, the courts under the Administrative Procedure Act and other standards of review, the court is going to ask whether the agency's rule is arbitrary and capricious, whether it has a, a substantial um, it has substantial evidence supporting the rule. Those are very low thresholds to clear. If you think about sort of preponderance of the evidence, the agency doesn't necessarily have to have the preponderance of the evidence to support its rule. It just has to show more than a de minimis level of rationality and and evidentiary support. And it has to show that it's grappled seriously with arguments that it received. But the agency ultimately can can disagree with 80 or 90 percent of the commenters and and agree with 10 percent. And that might be enough to sustain the agency's action in court. And so the key really is putting as much serious material and argument before the agency, because by the time you get to the court, the courts are so deferential under the APA and other doctrines, to, so deferential to the agencies, that it's really too late to make your own affirmative case in court. Yep. Well, I think we're going to be uh, uh, hearing from a lot of voices about a lot of potentially very controversial rules uh, in the near future. Yana and Adam, thank you very much for a really interesting dialogue. Um, we kind of have to bring the show to a close, but, sure. but, but before we do, uh, we will ask Adam, as we do every guest, a couple of questions, because we always like to hear answers and compare them. Uh, first, tell us something interesting about yourself that we would not know if we only knew you professionally. You know, I, it's such a humbling question to get, and, and just in case listeners don't know, I did know that question in advance. Um, and it's sad to think I had trouble thinking of something interesting that I do outside of work. Um, you know, I, I, I live pretty far from Washington, about uh, an hour west out in the Blue Ridge. I live out there with my wife and four daughters and a son and a couple of dogs, and we have a lot of room to roam out there. Maybe one interesting thing about me is, is one of my favorite hobbies now that we've moved out to the countryside is I love to cook and especially to, to smoke meats. And so throughout the summer, uh, spring, summer, fall, there's usually a healthy dose of, um, of, uh, of, of wood smoke flowing out of my backyard as I'm cooking up uh, briskets and ribs and just about anything else you can cook on a smoker. Ooh. I don't know that I'm any good at it, but it's a, it's a nice way to pass the time. Sounds like a great mouthwatering hobby. The second thing we like to ask is, what advice do you have for young lawyers or young law professors or even law students looking to do what you do? Well, let me. I'm going to harken back to what I used to do. I practiced law for 12 years, and I really loved it. I'm not one of these academics who hated legal practice and like fled it. I genuinely loved it. I just, I'm very lucky to get to do a job now that I love even more than that. And when I was practicing um, with Boyd and Grain Associates, which was a boutique firm, it still exists, a great firm. And then before that, I was in the energy practice at Baker Botts. I was really lucky to have really, really great mentors who taught me not just the strategic, the, the technical side of law, legal practice, but the strategy. I mean, the best days of my career as a practicing lawyer were sitting around a small table with uh, Boyd and Gray or at Baker Botts with folks like uh, Bruce Kiley and Randy McManus and Mark Cook, and just thinking through the strategy of really complex regulatory um, disputes. And so my advice to young lawyers is seek out mentors who who allow who bring you into that part of the work because it's, it's obviously you have to learn the nuts and bolts the basic blocking and tackling that's all really important but but just as important is developing a strategic mind and that's the kind of thing that you learn first and foremost from mentors so young lawyers who are just starting or or law students who are looking at firms figure out where you can find the best 
mentors on the strategic side of legal practice and it'll be great for your career and you'll love it. I mean, that was my favorite part of the job, without a doubt. I, I, I love my current job, but I miss those days of, of, of strategizing around the whiteboard with my old bosses. Oh, that's a great answer. What do you think, Yana? Do you agree? I absolutely agree. And I'm definitely lucky to have that. Um, Bigger Bots has not changed, Adam. <laughs> I have those fantastic mentors and I think it's really shaped my legal practice over the years and it's why I love doing what I do. That's really great. Okay. Now to wind it up for real, uh, we're going to end the show by playing a little game uh, called The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. <laughs> All right. So as the fun music indicates, this is really just uh, a way to get some maybe surprising answers yep. to, uh, from you to a question that we will choose at random. All you need to do is pick a number between one and ten. Oh, I'm going to pick uh, five for the kids. Oh, you're going to like this one. All right. Are you a cat person or a dog person or neither? And Why? Oh, I'm a total dog person. This was almost going to be my my, my interesting thing is uh, we've got two great, great dogs. We've got a, a pug named Alfie, and his older brother is a, a big black lab uh, named Lincoln um, after, of course, the, the greatest president. And I've – as all those hours that I spend out on the back patio uh, uh, smoking meats – I've probably spent ninety percent of that time just launching uh, frisbees out for for Lincoln to chase, you know, way, way, way down the the land uh, to to catch and bring back. So I am a total dog person. Um, I'm allergic to cats, or at least that's what I tell everybody. Um, I've never been um, quite a cat person, although um, I, I know some great cat people. Um, but for me, it's it's dogs, dogs, dogs. I just love them. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on our show. And to all the listeners out there, uh, hope to see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at, at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcasts, podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.